Smile and Learn. Hi, everyone. Welcome to my show, Science Madness. Today, we're going to dive into the world of electricity. Thank you, thank you. We have some really cool activities planned, including some science experiments. I know. So get ready for an awesome episode on electricity. For the first part of the show, we asked some children from around the world to explain what they know about electricity. Let's connect with our first friend. Hi guys. Electricity is something we need to power our electronic devices, such as televisions or my electric guitar. Before electricity was invented, people used candles for light. Now, with just a push of a button, we can light up our houses. Not only that, with electricity, we can power trains and amusement park rides. My teacher told us that we can create electricity by using the energy from natural resources such as water, oil, or even the sun. Thanks, guys. I think we learned a lot from our friends. As we saw, electricity is a type of energy we use to turn on lights or power our electronic devices. Electricity has become so important in our lives that we can't imagine living without it. As our last friend said, electricity can be produced in many different ways. Let's find out. We can use energy from natural resources like fossil fuels, wind, water, and the sun to create electricity. Let's take a look. Fossil fuels such as coal, gas, and oil are natural resources found beneath the Earth's surface. We burn these fossil fuels at power plants to boil large amounts of water. This produces steam that is powerful enough to turn a large turbine which basically looks like a big egg beater. When the turbines turn, they activate a generator that produces electricity. But we have to be careful because producing electricity with fossil fuels is harmful to the environment. Another way we can get electricity is by using the force of the wind. In other words, wind energy. Have you ever seen wind turbines? When the wind blows and pushes the blades of the wind turbines in a circular motion, it also turns a shaft, which activates the generator, producing electricity. We can also get energy from the force of the water. Maybe you have seen a dam. It is a big wall built to collect large amounts of water. The water is pushed through pipes, which creates the pressure needed to turn the blades of the turbine, thus activating the generator and producing electricity. This type of energy is called hydroelectricity. Lastly, we will talk about the energy we can use from the sun. This is called solar energy. When it's a sunny day, the solar panels capture the solar energy from the sun and transform it into electricity. Solar panels can be found on buildings, cars, boats, and space satellites. There are more ways to produce electricity from these natural resources, but the ones we saw today are the most common. Once the electricity is created using these natural resources, it is then transported through cables and wires to our homes, schools, and workplaces, ready for us to use. Electricity can also be stored in batteries that we use to power our flashlights, mobile phones, or remote controls. Well, there you have it. Now we know where our electricity comes from. It's important to understand that electricity should not be wasted. 
Remember to turn off the lights and other electrical devices when they're not in use. Up next, we're going to discover types of electricity and circuits. Stay tuned for our next video. Hey friends, welcome back to Science Madness, a program where we discover, learn, and experiment new things. In our last video, we learned what electricity was and where it came from. Today, we're going to learn about types of electricity and circuits. Are you ready? Let's start with a couple of questions. Have you ever walked across a carpet and later felt a small shock when you touched an object? Yes! yes. And have you ever brushed your hair for a while and noticed how it got stuck to your brush? Yes! yes. Good, well this happens because of static electricity, meaning that an electric charge is created when objects rub against each other. So let me explain. All objects are made up of atoms that are impossible to see because they are super small. These atoms have different electric charges, positive or negative. When two objects rub against each other, they become charged with energy, and the positive and negative charges move, creating an imbalance. We call this imbalance static electricity. Sometimes, static electricity causes two objects to stick together or attract to each other, such as hair and a brush, when we comb our hair. The brush has more positive charges and the hair has more negative charges. Positive and negative charges really like each other. That means they attract each other. Whereas atoms with the same charge don't like each other at all. Which is why you will notice that hairs want to separate from each other. This is because each strand of hair is negatively charged. When two objects have the same charge, either positive or negative, they either move away from each other or repel each other. Now we know why sometimes some objects give us a shock. It's because we send the excess electrical charge from one object to another. Now that we know what static electricity is, let's look at dynamic electricity. Static electricity only lasts a short time. Obviously, we can't use it to charge our cell phones or turn on a lamp. we need to obtain a different type of electricity using the natural resources around us. As I explained to you in our last video, the electricity we receive at home to run our electronic devices is called dynamic electricity. Dynamic electricity is the flow of electric charges. Just as water flows in a river, so do electrical charges in a cable. In order for electrical charges to flow continuously, we need a circuit. A circuit is a closed path in which electrical charges travel along. Circuits have two parts. The first is the source of electricity, which we discussed in the previous video. And the second corresponds to the materials that allow the flow of electric charges. I'm going to show you. Here we see an electric circuit inside this flashlight. There are two batteries, which are the source of electricity, and the wires that carry the electric charge to the bulb. If I turn on the switch, the electric charges begin to flow through the wires and the bulb emits light. If I turn off the switch, the electrical charges stop flowing and the bulb stops emitting light. This works the same as a drawbridge. When its parts are lowered, cars can go back on the road. The same is true for the electrical charges in a circuit. Alright guys, now that we've learned all about the types of electricity and circuits, let's see what you remember. An imbalance of positive and negative charges between two objects is called... Static Electricity! 
static electricity. That's it. And the flowing of electric charge is called dynamic electricity. Dynamic electricity. Very good. Great job. See you at the next show. Don't miss it. See you soon. Welcome back to Science Madness! In today's program, we're going to learn more about electricity. We'll create an electrical circuit and we'll find out which materials are conductors and insulators. Are you ready? We will start by building an electrical circuit, which, as you know, is a closed path that electric charges flow through. I will need two wires, a light bulb, and a battery. We will attach one end of the wire to the light bulb and the other to one of the battery's end. I'll repeat the same steps with the other wire and voila! We've just created an electrical circuit. The electric charges flow from the battery to the light bulb through the wires. And as a result, the light bulb lights up. Isn't it impressive? If I disconnect this circuit, the electric current stops flowing and the light bulb turns off. When I reattach the wire, the light bulb turns back on. How cool is that? Let's make this more interesting. What would happen if I added this spoon to the circuit? Do you think the light bulb would still work? Would you like to make a bet? Ta-da! The light bulb came on! Amazing, isn't it? Just like the copper inside the wires, this spoon is made of metal, and metal is a great conductor of electricity! Silver, iron, or aluminum are examples of conductive metals. Conductive materials allow electrical charges to flow through them, and therefore are the best materials to add to an electrical circuit. But conductive materials aren't only metals. Water, for example, is also a conductive material. Curious, isn't it? Let's try another type of material. Look at this rubber ducky. If we attach it to the circuit, what will happen? Will the light bulb turn on? Ooh, the light bulb didn't turn on. The little ducky is made of rubber and rubber is an insulating material. Insulating materials do not allow electric charges to flow through them. That's why the light bulb didn't light up. Other materials such as paper, plastic, or glass are also insulators. As you know, electricity can be very dangerous. So insulating materials are used to protect us from it. For example, the outside of wires are made of plastic and electricians' gloves are made of rubber. Well, I think that's it, friends. I hope you had fun and at the same time learned a lot of interesting things about electricity. See you soon. Welcome back to Science Madness. In today's program, we are going to learn about magnetism. Have you ever wondered why magnets stick to the fridge and don't fall off? <laughs> this happens thanks to a property called magnetism. Let's see what it's all about. Magnetism is the property some objects have that attracts other metallic elements, like iron. As you know, all matter has an electric charge. Normally, this charge is electrically neutral which means there is an equal number of negative and positive charges. However, in some materials this is not true, and this imbalance of charges causes attraction or repulsion. Magnets can be both natural and artificial. One of their main properties is the ability to attract objects made of iron and other metallic materials. This is called magnetism. Natural magnets are found in nature. An example is magnetite. Artificial magnets are made by humans from different metals, like iron or steel. So, what are the characteristics of magnets? Come with me to discover them. 
Magnets have two poles which we can find at their opposing ends. We call these ends the North Pole and the South Pole, and they generate a magnetic field. If we put two opposing poles together, they attract each other. This means that if we bring the North Pole of one magnet and the South Pole of another together, they attract each other. On the other hand, if we put two of the same poles together, they repel each other. Pretty interesting, right? But magnets aren't just used to hang the shopping list on the fridge. They can be used for many other things. Let's take a look at some examples. Digital storage devices such as hard disks and memory cards use magnetic properties to store data. Screens, speakers, and other electronic devices also have magnets inside them. They're everywhere. I'm sure you've probably seen magnets on the clasps of bags and purses before, right? Look closely. Did you know that compasses work thanks to magnets? Magnetism is very important in knowing our orientation and location. This is possible because our planet has a magnetic field that starts in the Earth's core, which is made up of metals such as iron and nickel, and extends through hundreds of miles of outer space. This magnetic field has a north and a south pole, just like magnets. Because of this, we can say that the Earth acts like a giant magnet. It moves the compass needle to the north and allows us to know where we are so we can move around without getting lost. Interesting, isn't it? Good job, my friends! I hope you like magnets as much as I do! See you in the next video! Bye-bye! Welcome back to Science Madness! In today's video, we're going to learn about a very special type of magnetism. Electromagnetism! First, let's review what electricity is. Electricity is a physical phenomenon that occurs when there is movement of electrical charges in objects. This is called an electrical current. These electrical charges can be positive or negative. Now that we have reviewed what electricity is, do you remember what magnetism is? Magnetism is a very interesting property that some objects have. It causes them to attract metallic elements, like iron. These objects are called magnets. They can be natural or artificial, and have two magnetic poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. Have you ever used a compass to orient yourself? A compass uses a magnetized needle that always points to the Earth's magnetic North Pole, which allows us to locate ourselves on a map. And do you remember what a magnetic field is? Exactly! It is the space surrounding a magnet where its magnetic force acts. In other words, it is the space where a magnet can attract other metals. Now we are ready to learn what electromagnetism is. Here we go! Let's start with a bit of history. In the 19th century, a scientist named Hans Christian Oersted discovered that when he brought a compass close to an electric charge, the compass needle didn't point north anymore. What do you think this meant? That's right! Electric currents produce a magnetic field! Wow! We call this relationship between electricity and magnetism, electromagnetism. Let's see if you can guess what this is. It's an electromagnet. We can generate a magnetic field very easily thanks to electromagnets. This involves tuning a metal bar into a magnet by connecting it to an electric current, in this case a battery. To do this, we wind a wire of conductive material, such as copper, iron, or aluminum, around the metal bar. So why are we doing this? Remember how I told you earlier that electric currents generate magnetic fields? Well, this wire's magnetic field is very weak on its own, so by wrapping it around the metal bar in a spiral shape, we concentrate the magnetic field in a small area, which increases its power. 
When we turn on the electromagnet, the electric current starts to circulate, activating the magnetic field and attracting nearby metals. It's impressive, isn't it? We can also use electromagnets in a variety of ways. We can find them in bells or car brakes, but we can also find them in huge cranes they use to attract metal waste in landfills. Good job, friends. See you in the next episode. Bye-bye. We've learned so much in just one video. Did you know there are many more videos? Imagine how much you could learn. Subscribe to the Smile and Learn educational channel to learn and have fun at the same time.